Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at PAIPL for our Friday, first Friday environmental series called Caring for Creation with Southeast PAIPL. I'm going to share my screen. Yes, here we go. And I have a few introductory slides for you. Here we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. It's not polluted by other windows, is it? Perfect. Um, so here we are, Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light in our Caring for Creation with Southeast PA IPL series. This workshop number four that is part of this series is called The Healing Spirit of the Earth and will be delivered by our dear friend and board member, Dr. Patricia DeMarco. We are generously funded, oh, Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light, as many of you know, is an organization that inspires and mobilizes people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on environmental justice or climate change from an ethical and a moral perspective. The reason that we do this right now is we it is um, our present circumstances demand action. We are witnessing the loss of nature and the spread of human suffering at unprecedented levels and our sacred texts and moral values, no matter which faith tradition we subscribe to, require us to protect creation and pursue justice. Our actions can engender hope and motivate change in personal and community behaviors and in public policy. So we appreciate your support, uh, your friendship, and your attendance at our functions and sessions so that we can work together to bring our mission to a reality. This series is generously funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection in their Environmental Education Grant Program. We have a wonderful project advisor named Kathleen Bansky and a number of partners. This virtual series was particularly developed to serve the people of Southeast Pennsylvania and those uh, in Germantown in particular, but we're fortunate to, through Zoom to be able to broadcast this across the state. Our partner in Southeast PA is is FUMCOG or First United Methodist Church of Germantown. In southwestern Pennsylvania, we work with Ballfield Farm, Garfield Community Farm, Valley View President Presbyterian Church, and the Perry Hilltop and Fine View Citizens Councils. And we've applied for this grant again in 2023. If we are fortunate to receive funding again, we'll be expanding our partnerships to include youth members of these communities, particularly in um, Garfield and Perry Hilltop. Uh, we'll be working with the Pittsburgh Project and their after school program and with BASE, which is short for Brothers and Sisters Emerging in Garfield. So we'll be taking all the lessons that we've been sharing until June and we're going to adapt them to appeal to a younger audience through games and sort of on, hands on activities. So it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, we are hiring a new person to help us with that. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing at this point, and we're going to allow Patty to share. There we are. There we go. We're still recording. Okay. So is it mine now? Yes, please, Patty. Proceed. Hey. Well, good, happy everybody to the new, happy new year to everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you on this first, first Friday Caring for Creation session. And today I thought I would talk about the healing power of the earth as a subject for us to draw strength from in all the trials and tribulations that we may face in our daily life. And the first thing I like to take a, a message from Rachel Carson as a reflection to start with is that we're really interconnected. Uh, her words are, man does not relive apart from the world. He lives in the midst of a complex dynamic interplay of physical, chemical, and biological forces. And between us and this environment are continuing never ending interactions. This is a, this is a relationship that has sustained people from the beginning of our time and even from before people were on the earth. It's important to recognize that we are really very physically connected to so much of the rest of the country. Just from sitting here in Pennsylvania, we are 
right here at the three rivers. And we're connected through all of these waterways into the Mississippi River drainage. This is the great Mississippi River drainage that covers more than, more than a third, almost half of the United States. And this is a way that we really have drawn our support. It has been the sustenance of civilization for thousands of years, even before our modern civilized times. So the natural resources of the earth that were there before human infrastructure, before human activities of, the, um, of our modern world, it sustained indigenous peoples and many, many, many species of living animals and plants for lots and lots of years. And we really are blessed to have a life support system. It's fueled by the solar power of our star, the sun, and it gives us in everything we need is within the living earth. Uh, the systems for generating clean water, fertile ground, clean air, and also the biodiversity of species, the interconnected web of life of which humans are but one part. And we have many gifts of the living earth that come from just the structure of how the earth functions these interconnected relationships that have developed over thousands of years really provide the resources that we need to be sustained. And they are provisioning services, supporting services, cultural services, and regulating services. So the first of these is the supporting services. And these are the nutrient cycles, phosphorus, carbon, nitrogen, that cycle through the re, through the uh, ecosystems of the earth in the food webs and regenerating. You know the water cycle, which takes precipitation and evaporation and uh, continues the cycle of water. But these, new, these cycles also include the primary production system, things like crop pollination and soil formation, and the essential one of photosynthesis, which takes sunlight and minerals from the ground and water and creates sugars and starches and uh, fiber, foodstuffs that we need. The second one is the regulating services. Now this is one that we're beginning to understand a lot better recent in recent times because we're beginning to see some disruptions in it. One of the most important ones is the great uh, belt uh, of the thermal haline belt that cools and controls the temperature of the earth because uh, salt water is heavier than uh, fresh water and cold water is heavier than hot water. So just by the changing concentration of the salt and the heat uh, at the equator, it drives this huge belt of, tie of uh, uh, water circulation around the world in the oceans that controls the temperatures. And you've heard of disruptions from the El Nino and La Nina effect. You've seen uh, the disruption of the polar um, uh, aspect of this. And as the uh, uh, glaciers are melting, the freshwater infusion is getting greater and is uh, slowing down. They have, they've detected measurable slowing down of this uh, current that is uh, one of our, our temperature thermostats of the planet. There are other regulating mechanisms that control pests. Whoops, sorry. Ah. Uh, that control pests and diseases um, with uh, creatures that are predators eating things that are pests and keeping them under control. And you also have water purification systems occurring through wetlands and forests, uh, ecosystems on the edge of the sea that cause um, purification of the water and, and buffering of the land from the oceans. Uh, all of these regulating systems are naturally functioning. They do not require man-made interference of any kind. Then there are the provisioning services. And these are ones that we really depend on for the production of food and fiber, for biofuel, they create fresh water and they create oxygen through photosynthesis. These services are essential for us. We use them every day and we may not even know about them. 
And then there are the cultural services, the recreational benefits, the landscapes, the spiritual inspiration derived from being in the natural world, and the sense of wonder that comes in connecting to nature, and also a source of healing from reflecting on our place in the natural world. So one of the things that I find really inspiring and important in this connection of um, how we are connected to the earth is to recognize that the earth has a healing power for people, but also that if we take care of the land, we're also taking care of ourselves. Some things that have um, really prominent examples of that are um, the Wangari Mathai's efforts in the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, where she worked with women to plant a million native trees that were in an area that had been uh, pretty much decimated by over harvesting and overdevelopment. She worked with the women to plant trees that were native to the area that restored the balance of the seasons, allowed them to grow crops under shade plants, uh, restored the health of the watersheds, and the river became a viable living river again, uh, where it had been pretty much a you know, polluted uh, stream. You can see the effect of the Green Belt movement now, even from satellite visions. You can see the greening of that whole area of Kenya where her work took place. And this was an initiative that also helped to break the cycle of poverty because the women were able to grow food not only for their own families, but also to sell. And it created a local economy that was based on the health of the land using native plants and native trees in harmony with each other to restore the fertility of the ground. This is a tremendous success story and she received a Nobel Prize for her efforts and is one of the heroes of the um, green movement really uh, way ahead of her time. And uh, if you don't know her story, it's one worth reading. Another area that you can see more locally is the whole initiative for community gardens. This is uh, an effort of the Allegheny Land Trust. Um, this is a, a garden in uh, Garfield. And this is an area we now have more than 400 community gardens just in Pittsburgh. Um, where people are looking at places that have been abandoned, perhaps lots that have been uh, left, um, you know, in decrepit condition where buildings have come down. People are now restoring those as growing spaces and growing them as community centers for food development. And you build community around the concept of growing your own food. This is a movement that is uh, really helping to um, not only build community, but also to build healthier places within communities because people feel a vested interest in preserving those spaces that they share in the production for. And here again, you know, the message of Rachel, Rachel Carson is important that if you contemplate the beauty of the earth, you find reserves of strength that endure as long as life lasts. And this is really, I think a way to connect with the real with the real living earth is to see how your community benefits from having living spaces, green spaces, whether it's a yard, a garden, or whether it's a deliberately planted community greening um, project. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, so you can also find Earth's power as a personal source of strength. And there are lots of ways to do this. Um, I don't know how many of you, it's hard to do an interactive when you're on Zoom, but uh, think about the ways that you yourself draw from nature. Does anybody want to share an experience in any of these things? Um, these are common ways of um, connecting to nature on a daily basis. You can do a walking meditation, which is slow walking, noticing all of the living things in your surroundings. You can do this in your neighborhood. You can do it in a park. You can do it along the seashore, but just minutely noticing the smells, the scent, the, the feel of the air, the feel of the terrain under your feet and what you see around you, all of the little creatures that you may not notice unless you're particularly looking for them. Um, to do nature journaling, this is a practice that I have happened that I've had for years and years. 
it's just noticing the condition of things around you on a daily basis and writing about them and connecting your sense of wellness, your sense of well-being to the to the creatures and the things that are around you in the natural world. Um, you can adopt a tree as a personal spirit guide. This is my 110 year old pin oak in my backyard that is my spirit guide. And um, I have spent many hours under this tree. And uh, you feel a connection to the life cycle of that tree. You feel the changes of the seasons. You notice the creatures that are supported in its branches. You notice the things that are growing around the bottom. You take care of it. You see to it that it's pruned and, and kept free of, um, of debris and injury. Uh, this is a, a very personal kind of a connection that you can have with a living thing. And it really does give you a sense of strength. I can assure you, I, I will tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. You can practice gardening. Anytime you're up to your wrists in dirt and you're finding the earthworms and you're finding the little nematodes that live in the ground and that scent of the, of the, of the uh, fresh ground when you turn it over in the spring and then having, whether it's flowers or fruits or vegetables that you have had your own hand in forming, this is a bond with the living earth that is really very, very close and really crosses generations in some, in some ways. Um, my family were farmers in Italy and they came here and they farmed in Pittsburgh. And um, it was what kept us hale and healthy in times when we really would have been relatively poor. Um, bird watching is a, one of the most popular hobbies around the world because these little creatures who fly around all around us really give us a window into the condition of the, of the world around us, especially the migratory birds. They're under pretty great duress right now from the uh, stresses of climate change and pollution for loss of habitat. So anything you can do to make spaces for, for birds and wildlife in your own community, whether in your own yard or whether in your community spaces, this is something that really enriches the world around you and enriches your own experience as well. And then I don't know many artists or musicians who have not at some point been inspired by the natural world. Uh, some of the most amazing music that has ever been written, you know, you think of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony and you think of, you know, Mahler's Ninth, uh, things that have really drawn from the passion of the, word, of the, of the earth and the, the seasons. Um, these are things that um, can nourish and sustain you if, you're, if your talent lies in that direction. Um, there was a, a plein air painting group that came frequently to the Rachel Carson Homestead to paint in the gardens there. And this kind of painting is, I admire it much. I can't do it at all, but it is so inspiring to see people interpret and, and feel the, uh, the inspiration from the natural world. And of course, you can always take a child with you when you go into the, into the natural world because you see things fresh through a child's eyes. And introducing children to the experience of finding and seeing birds for the first time or identifying the flowers or making up imaginary games around the things that you find in a garden or park. These things are tremendously wonderful um, experiences that you can treasure forever. So I want to um, tell you a little bit about my own personal story. I don't, I think we have a little time, right? Do we have time, Kathy? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, um, I just finished writing my second book, which is In the Footsteps of Rachel Carson, Harnessing the Healing Power of the Earth. And this was really um, my story of how I have fought with cancer for four, four bouts of battle with cancer. And Really, it was my connection to the natural world and my sense of purpose in living in harmony with nature that gave me the strength to get through all of this and which I continue to rely on on a daily basis. But I wanted to share with you maybe one essay out of here. Um, and it comes from my time in Alaska when I was far from home. And because it was written at around Christmas time, I thought this would be a good thing to share with you today. 
So if you will permit, I'll just read you one essay. This was uh, written in the year 2000. On Christmas Eve, close to midnight, I was walking in the quiet calm of new snow under a sky clear between storms. All the lamp posts on the driveway were glazed with icy frost, their light diffused into a soft glow. The spotlight over the driveway was out for some reason and the night was dark in a cloudless sky with no moon. Many of the neighbors were outside of Alaska for the holidays and their houses were invisible in the darkness. All of the constellations of heaven sparkled in the black sky, seemingly only an arm's length away. Orion the hunter, Cassiopeia, the great dipper, right above the house. Here on the edge of the mountain, close to the tree line, the heavens felt so close. I remembered my father's tales of the sky from my earliest childhood days, and I strolled in wonder down the familiar driveway, marveling at each alder bush covered with bright ice from the afternoon rain that preceded the snow. No purchase decorations could rival the iced alder seed cones. I found two young moose bedded down in the snowbank behind the house. They curled up beside each other and their heat melted a little cave into the snow to protect them from the wind. They often slept against the house under the vent from the furnace. And in the early morning, they would munch my bushes for breakfast. But on Christmas morning, I couldn't begrudge them their meal. It was hard to be away from family at such a time. Christmas memories brought a, a tightness to my throat as I imagined the whole body of our 58 relatives and friends gathered in my parents' home celebrating Vigilia of Christmas. For so many years, I was there to clean the squid and make the kaval and the pizzel with my nana. And I knew there would be celebrations in Alaska, but I wasn't yet knit into the community and I couldn't help but feel sad and homesick as I wandered about the wisdom of moving so far from my roots. The sharp cold of the Alaska night pierced into my bones and the world felt hard and harsh. And as I reached the cul-de-sac at the end of the driveway to let my black Labrador run around, the sky was suddenly illuminated with a display of the aurora borealis. The ribbons of green, pink, and yellow cascaded toward the horizon like lightning in slow motion. I stood there, well wrapped in my fur coat and hat, but shivering in wonder at this majestic display. I'm going to stop there. So what I found is that you never know what you're going to find in the natural world if you're open to observation. I have never forgotten that evening, <clears throat> standing there shivering on that Christmas night in seeing the sky just turn all kinds of colors. It was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen in many ways. So I would encourage you to make note of the things that you encounter in your own life in the living earth and and to celebrate these things they're worth preserving and they need us to speak up for the creation for this wonderful world this living earth it isn't going to save itself it will heal but we have to stop hurting it we have to stop what we're doing to destroy it on a daily basis and everyone has not just the obligation, but the privilege of living in a time where we can make a huge difference in the fate of our earth, in the fate of ourselves. Uh, there are people who do this on a regular basis. I want to share with you my friend Kiersey Yansa, who does earth care self-care sessions at the Frick Environmental Center on uh, Wednesdays, the first Wednesday of every month. And uh, you can find out about that from the Parks Conservancy calendar. So. Are there any questions or things you want to highlight or talk about further? Uh, I will stop sharing my screen so that I can see you and uh, we can have a little time for discussion. Absolutely, please everyone. Um, we, we do have extra time today, so it would be wonderful for you to all share your thoughts and experiences on how you use the earth as the healing power of the earth and how you would like to protect it. I can start. I'll share. Oh, go, bit. please. Please do. Okay. My name is Dennis Gross. I live in Erie County, Pennsylvania, uh, formerly the home of the Eries and Seneca Nations, among others. <laughs> uh, I noticed that one of 
Patricia's early slides uh, included a, uh, a photo of someone sitting on a beach, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, looking out at the sea, uh, perhaps meditating on uh, in some peaceful way. I've had the same experience here with uh, Lake Erie. Pennsylvania mm -hmm. has about 40 miles of Lake Erie. And you can look out there and almost imagine that you're sitting at the ocean. It has the effect, uh, whether it's ocean or lake, of giving you some sense of peace and uh, allowing you to center your thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, it also provides the opportunity for seeing the power of nature at times when there's a storm. The storm we had uh, around Christmas Day was uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting experience in that regard. Having said that, though, uh, I previously lived in southwestern Pennsylvania, Fayette County, mm -hmm. and that's an area that is uh, much more uh, where hills and hollows are much more commonly found. It's another opportunity sitting in the midst of those hills down perhaps in a valley of some sort uh, to feel like you're enfolded in the earth and gives you a sense of uh, being one with the earth. Uh, sometimes even uh, taking in both the beauty of the earth and then your, your gaze may fall down to a stream that's yellow with acid mine drainage. It's quite a contrast and gives you an opportunity to contemplate that as well. Thank you so much that's for sharing that. Right. Wonderful. Uh, Helga has a hand up. Helga, would you like to speak? Yeah, um, I, we're here blessed in Pittsburgh with all those wonderful parks and just taking off for an hour or two, going to, I don't know, near me is Settler's Cabin or other little parks, go for a hike. And it's so refreshing for both uh, body and soul. Now, I'm always also fascinated by the um, use of describing nature in a metaphorical way. If you uh, see like in religious writings, in inspirational writings, so often there is like the sun is always used as a metaphor for um, the warmth of uh, the spiritual power. And uh, just in many ways, there's some, um, it makes you see that all this is connected, as you said. Yes. Very much so. Thank you for that. Uh, Patricia Libby has a hand up. You need to unmute. Okay. Yeah, um, I live in Philadelphia in a very congested part of the city called Roxboro, but I only live a block from City Park, um, which part of it surrounds the high school football field. So I go over to the football field every morning and hike around it several times. But it's been amazing the wildlife that one sees there when the birds are flying over in the spring and the fall. Um, <laughs> I get to see an amazing variety of birds up there. And sometimes they actually come down to the football field and look for food. Um, but one day I was there and there was a mother deer and two of her babies. And they were, it was absolutely wonderful to see them. I, I walked all the way around the field. They kept eating. It was great. Um, I saw the gate that they came into. And by the time I was leaving, they were going back out of it. But I came back the next day and one of the babies was dead. Oh. It was sitting by, laying by the fence obviously shot by someone oh and I thought oh my well there's the beginning and the end of life um I call the city park people the um the high school the <laughs> the education department all of that somebody finally came and got it but they only put it across the street on the park side where it lay, oh gee, must have been a month. Mm. Um, animals having their dinner off of the poor little deer. 
and people going past it without realizing what was there or why it was there. But it was it was a wonderful realization of our birth and our passing. And of course, once we're up in heaven, we can look back down and smile and wave at all the animals and enjoy the birds and all of that again, which I hope the little deer was able to do too. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, anyone else want to share any ideas or thoughts? I shared this at our conference yeah. when Patty joined us for this presentation in November. Um, when I was a child, we visited an area in the Allegheny National Forest where my grandfather and many of his steelworker buddies had a cabin together. And I so looked forward to the sometimes two weeks every summer we would spend there and then we would go up there in the, the fall for a fall festival and, and uh, some holidays as well. And I, I can't tell you how happy it made me feel and how fulfilled it made me feel. And it wasn't just the location, it was the smells. The air was so different than what we had in the suburbs or the, the dense urban area of the city. You could smell the sweet hay scented ferns. It, it smelled clean and fresh. Uh, in the morning, there was fog that made you feel like you were uh, completely open your breathing passages were open. And I didn't really realize this at the time because I was very young, but it was really a, a force of strength for me. Unfortunately, we can't go there anymore, but I find similar, I try to find similar experiences um, on my bike rides when I when I um, take part in the, the Montour Trail or the Great Allegheny Passage. I call it my forest bathing. So, you know, the Japanese have an actual, um, technique that they call forest bathing, where you, you go out into the forest alone or with a, a guiding mentor and you meditate and walk through the forest to feel the, the power of nature and how that affects you. Uh, so I've, I've always benefited from being in the forest or remote locations and, and the beach too. I love the beach, uh, the, the sounds of the ocean on the coming up on the, the sand, um, just find that very relaxing and, and um, penetrating. Um, so I, I encourage all of us to keep working to preserve these wild spaces and so we can have more of them or encourage more of them. Uh, I know Patty's on the board of the Allegheny Land Trust, which is a, an air, a group here that tries to purchase land to preserve our remote spaces, which is wonderful. And I think Dee Kachirka is still on the board, uh, still here with us. Yeah. She works with the Isaac Walton League to do plantings in these types of spaces so that we protect our watersheds. So those are just some of the kinds of projects we could work on together in your areas of the world. Jack, Jack has a hand up, Jack Hoffer. Uh, I'd just like to know to tell you that I'm excited about joining with the local um, um, I, uh, IPO member, uh, Greg Williams here is um, mm -hmm. getting a lot of us involved in planting native trees in our area. Okay. He sent me a list of 48 different mm -hmm. native trees that are available through the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Yeah, excellent. It's an order for him. And, the, and they're, he's, a, he's a, um, encouraging a group of a, uh, churches in this area to work on a project on a um, rails to trail air, uh, park that runs from Holidaysburg to um, Huntington, Pennsylvania. It's called the Lower Trail. And he's been involved in removing non-native plants and planting native species along this entire 20 mile uh, mm -hmm. rails to trails project. And he's got me excited about helping with that this spring and, and then uh, helping to deliver these trees that are available through the uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited about getting involved this spring. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dylan, Dylan Weiss has a hand up. Dylan? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, because I have had lost everything. I just, I wanna say, you know, uh, thank you for, for the wonderful words that you have given us and the slides, they're fabulous. And I always hang on every word that you say. Mm -hmm. I wanna share the most amazing uh, experience I had in the last couple of years. So I, uh, with Penn Future, went on an outing to Hawk Mountain. 
and sat and did uh, the forest bathing experience for like four hours. We just sat there and it was the most astounding experience I have ever had. And right down to understanding that these wonderful raptors were doing a dance for us out in the sky. I mean, it appeared that they were entertaining us. They were doing a bird ballet. I mean, and then the sounds and the smells, everything about it was just astounding. Yeah. And and so I'm looking forward to reading your your next book. Oh, so thank much. you <laughs> so much. So I won't say anything else, but um, I, I'm I'm I have moved, and so I need to reestablish my relationship with my new environment and what's around here. Excellent. Hawk Mountain is really a very inspiring place. I would encourage anyone who has access to it to go there. It's wonderful. I have Donna and then Paul. Uh, Donna? Uh, Paul? Yes. Uh, Patty, thank you so much for this presentation. Wonderful. Uh, I just kudos to everyone who spoke. And I just want to just comment on, um, you know, I think there's this inner uh, spirit that wants to connect with the natural world and yeah. um, just an e example uh, and that involves the spirit it involves the the soul it involves the body involves everything um, we I'm up here in uh, Scranton uh, Pennsylvania northeastern Pennsylvania and uh, on our mother house grounds uh, we have been uh, uh, utilizing uh, Greg Williams skills and his uh, connection to the native trees and over the last couple of years we have been planting native trees and getting rid of um, invasive species but especially during the pandemic uh, we're above Marywood University and a lot of folks don't know we're here uh, they just go as far as the university and that's it but during the pandemic especially people I, I guess this need just this connection happened and people began to discover that we were back here planting trees and for the neighbors not just for us and the wonderful relationships that developed with our neighbors uh, human neighbors as well as our uh, creature neighbors, uh, the deer and um, the nuthatches and those one, all creatures of all different kinds, uh, the fox. And uh, just to comment on that interconnection, um, it, it's marvelous. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Paul Burbaker and then Kent Bay. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity to, to mention or say something. I have a couple of comments. I appreciate this very much as it's been an excellent presentation uh, that you had, Patricia. And when you talked about uh, nature journaling, and I, I'd like to throw out a, a book that I'm reading right now, and I'm not, <laughs> I guess this is allowed. I'm not trying to yeah. uh, advertise, but uh, this is a, a book called uh, Braiding Sweetgrass by... Uh, Joe, uh, Robin Kemmerer. It's a magnificent book about our relationships to the world that we live in. And I, I would encourage people to pick it up. It's very readable and very interesting. Anyway, so that was just something I wanted to mention. And um, the other thing is the business about birding. I'm an avid bird watcher. And I was out bird watching this morning with a group of people. And I do every Friday morning. And uh, we saw a winter wren and just watching that little bird bob up and down and complain that we were there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a tremendous connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does something, I don't even know what it does to me, but it does something to be out there and in, in the world and to be able to to uh, ex have these experiences. It make, makes makes you heal, I think is the word yes. you would use. Yes. And I think that, that that's great. And then the last thing I'd like to just, there's something out you were talking about ecosystems and the way that they work and over time and one of the things that I've been amazed with as I fly across our country the United States from the east to west coast is looking down on those prairies that are now all farmed a lot of circles that where irrigation is going on and I often contemplate when I do that about what have we done to interrupt the way things used to be I know we we need it for food and what have you, but uh, you know I like I like to know if you have any comments about that. I mean, when you talk about the 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 way the Earth uh, use has systems that work together, uh, right now we're seeing climate change, which is a rapid change. But I wonder if there isn't a really slow change that's occurring because of of what we've already done to the or what we've yeah. done to the Earth in the name of progress. 
I would just like to tell you that regenerative agriculture was actually incorporated into the Farm Bill. It was one of the initiatives from the Reimagine Appalachia Blueprint, and there are three years of underwriting support for moving farming at any scale from large to huge toward regenerative practices. So there's a lot more on that. I put a reference in the chat and I wanna call on Kent Bay before we run out of time and then Helga has her hand up again. Kent, the floor is yours. Yes, good. Peace, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, wow, this, is, this has really been uh, very enlightening. I appreciate everyone sharing in this, uh, in this uh, this webinar here, and and certainly you, Patricia, you Thank you. you never cease to uh, cease to educate me on, on so many things. I love your spirit. I love being around you. You you are a truly awesome person. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, this is my my first webinar with uh, the PA Interfaith uh, Southwest uh, Pennsylvania Interfaith Light and Power. So. Uh, certainly not disappointed in, 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 and I'm hearing exactly what I, I thought I would have experienced. So thank each and every one of you for uh, having these awesome presentations and uh, I'm going to continue to come and can, continue to learn and, and hopefully be able to uh, apply many of the things that I'm going to be learning here at our uh, urban farm site in the Hill District neighborhood of Pittsburgh and Peace and Friendship Farm. Uh, and of course, everyone is invited and hopefully I can have something special to uh, accommodate everyone and uh, get to know each and every one of you and you get to know me as well. So thanks again and uh, this is wonderful. Kent, I hope that you take an opportunity sometime to share us your experience with building that farm and the Friendship Park. I think you've done such a tremendous amount of work over there. Welcome, welcome to Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light Southwest chapter. I hope we come to see you often here. Helga, I will give you uh, a chance to speak again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on your one entry about taking children in nature. Yeah. I had personally the good fortune of growing up in that tradition. <laughs> and sometimes I joke my aunt invented forest bathing because she always reminded us on each hike to breathe. <laughs> but there's uh, also um, research out there that all the great uh, environmentalists like Rachel Carson and others were allowed to roam as kids freely out in nature. That's right. And uh, that's like a threads for everything. So um, yes, it's very important. It is. Wow. Well, I'm going to give this back to Kathy because I know we have a couple of things she wanted to do before we were finished today. And um, is, does anyone else want to add a comment before we do that? We have time for maybe one more. Oh, we have plenty of time. Oh, we do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would anyone else like to share? Yeah, Dor Dolores. You're muted. Okay, yeah. After, there you are. I just wanted to say that I'm so thankful for all the tree planting. Um, uh, and I think you recognize by this time that trees are sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And they do best in a social setting where they can intertwine their roots and share their pheromones. And so when you do the tree planting, would you be certain that they are planted in company? Um, I had the terrible experience of um, seeing a tree planted as a memorial, and it was done in an, ancient, an old um, stone-bordered place where the roots couldn't reach out. And I had been in touch with a wonderful beechnut tree, the ancient beechnut tree, and hugged it. And because I had my hands on that memorial tree, the beechnut tree understood that this little tree was a, an orphan. Mm -hmm. And so um, it adopted the tree and had me taking messages back and forth between, the, between them. <laughs> So you have a spirit tree as well. <laughs> uh, I am fortunate my pin oak has a sister 
uh, right across where their branches overlap and intermingle and their roots overlap and intermingle. And I wrote in my book about the gifts of the healing trees. Uh, there's a whole chapter about that. But I was when I was having chemotherapy, I would take my Afghan, it was in the summertime of 2018, and I would take my nap in the grass on the Afghan. And you can feel the the roots below you and the leaves above you, and you're sort of cradled in these space between the earth and the sky. And you can really feel the force of the tree, you know, running through you. There is a definite sense of it. And of course, your eye level, and I don't mow my grass much, so I could see the bees visiting the clover and I happened to look and see there was a frog on the edge of my pond. It was like right, you know, eye to eye. It's really a very special experience to feel connected that way. And there really is a, a whole network of communication going on, not just from the rootlets of trees to each other, but also the pheromones that travel through the stomata of the leaves. And you have to think about what are they getting as messages about the world around them. You figure a, a tree 118 years old would have been there when the steel mills were running. A tree that old would have been there, you know, when the, the beginnings of air travel and there were different kinds of petrochemicals floating around in the sky. And they're all captured into the, into the bark, into the wood of the tree over the time of years. And so, you recognize that a tree of 115 is still a, a teenager. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially an oak. They live to be hundreds of years old if you can take care of them well. Exactly. Now, if someone wants a good source, there's a wonderful book called, um, put out by Wall Laban, W O H L E B E N, two L's, I think. And it's the secret life of trees, oh, yes. and it's written by a a form a ranger who's now retired, um, ab about his experience of researching and finding the the social life of of mm -hmm. these trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, okay, I have Patricia Libby has her hand up again, and, and Kent, do you still have your hand up, or is it up a second time? Patricia Libby. Did you want to speak again? Um, yes. Uh, thinking about feelings toward trees. Um, my heart broke this year when I heard in New York they had cut down an 85 foot tall tree to take down into New York to put up by the park for Christmas. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> no. <laughs> And then this is the first year that this really had happened to me. My, my local park that I live by um, sells little Christmas trees. And every time I would pass, my heart would break all these little baby trees that had just been cut off of their roots and taken in here to be taken to people's houses to be set up, some with water, some without. And this morning, it was the trash day and my neighbors were putting out all of their, their little trees to be taken away by the trash trucks. And I was walking past just kind of blessing each one as I went past saying, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for giving so much cheer and happiness. I'm so sorry that you had to be cut down and your life was not spared. I, I really wish that people in the future would get more artificial trees for their homes and not cut down the live ones since they're the ones that are helping us take out the carbon dioxide in the air, giving us fresh oxygen. I should think the farmers that raise them could do something else that was more beneficial. <laughs> well, there are lots of debates to be had about that whole thing. Yeah. I, I've tried a couple of times to put living trees in the house and plant them again. One year I got an inundation of little tiny black aphids in the house that I couldn't get rid of for a year, infested everything. And another year I tried keeping it alive and I, I was watering it and everything and it just got dry as dust. And even if I watered it, it didn't live. So I was very frustrated. I've, I've resorted to decorating with 
just cut holly branches and pine cones and stuff in, and poinsettia plants instead of little trees. It's just, it's a sadness, but I really, I feel like you do. I, I don't feel happy cutting down a tree just to bring it inside for a while. So. Yeah. I've noticed people in our neighborhood are now decorating their trees outdoors instead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and it's just as effective if you're fortunate to have one outside your window that you can see them, you don't have to bring them inside so, or perhaps bringing one in that doesn't have aphids with a root ball or oh, in a pot that you can then replant later. But there's lots, lots of discussion to be had on that. Um, we do have to think about closing. So I yes. really appreciate all of your sharing. Yeah. Uh, this was a wonderful experience today, uh, talking about the spirituality of uh, being in the wild, being in the forest, being in nature, and particularly communing with trees. Can I add one more little thing? I have a friend that recently learned that she has a disorder where electronic devices disrupt her body, uh, her mind and her body, uh, they really make her ill. Um, and so she has to eliminate her computer and her cell phone and even electronic meters, you know, the um, digital meters that water companies and electric, electric companies use to record your usage now. Uh, she needs to use, live in a different kind of environment. And she finds that she goes out to an oak tree, a large mature oak tree in her park near her, and she just sits with and grounds herself with her hands on the ground or feet on the ground near this tree every day for several hours. And it actually, besides the spiritual effect, it has a physical effect where it, she feels that the earth tree is drawing the negative electrons out of her body or what, you know, I don't know the science behind it, but somehow this tree is aiding her in a, as a physical way as well as a spiritual way. So the trees are truly amazing, but, and we know what we, we benefits we receive from our pets, uh, how they help us. So other mammals and, and, and even other types of species uh, that really help us to live through difficult times and heal our bodies in, in those ways too, even if they're not wild animals, you know, we have them indoors. So we have a lot to thank um, our creator for in, in the sense of giving us these opportunities, commune with other beings, other species on the planet. Um, I would like to close with a with a brief prayer that Helga was kind uh, to share. So let me bring that up. I don't want to put you on the spot, Helga, but if you would like to read, I'd be happy to have you do the honors. Sure. Can you see Thank it? You. Yes. Blessed is the spot, and the house, and the place, and the city, and the heart, and the mountain, and the refuge, and the cave, and the valley, and the land, and the sea, and the island, and the meadow, where mention of God hath been made, and his praise glorified. Baha'u'llah. There we go. That was neat. Thank you, Helga. That was truly lovely. I appreciate you sharing. And I think what makes PA IPL so beautiful is that we have the opportunity to share blessings and thoughts and lessons from all faiths. So um, the Baha'i faith is definitely one that I would like to learn more about. Being a Lutheran by birth and by practice now, uh, I appreciate your sharing this. So if anyone else would like to share prayers uh, from a different or reflections from different faiths, we're definitely open to that. We hope we can do that soon. Um, you may hear my dog in the background now. But <laughs> um, my name is Kathy again, and you can always reach me at outreach at paipl.org or 412-953-5202. And we look forward to expanding these workshops into the new year. We, we do hold these every first Friday of every month from noon to one. We appreciate you sharing your lunch hour with us. Next up will be 
uh, lessons on air and water pollution. We're probably going to focus in on that in that workshop on not the broader topic of air and water pollution, but particularly how single use plastics and other plastics affect us through air and water pollution, both by their um, the extraction of fossil fuels required to develop those materials and then throwing them away into the environment after we're finished with them. So please join us again in February. I believe it's February 3rd. Um, yes, February 3rd. Yeah, thanks, Patty. <laughs> Don't have my dates up. So we look forward to seeing you then. Um, and um, have a wonderful new year. Stay in touch and feel free to reach out if you would like to join any of our other events. Uh, we're beginning to prepare for the bike and hike. So look, we have, we have a lot to look forward to there. We have a revised in-person plan and virtual plan coming this year and it kind of excite us all a little bit. So look forward to sharing that with you in the near future and have a lovely day.